Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. This episode is set to publish on August 24th, which just so happens to be my 9th and 11th anniversaries with my husband. We got married on the second anniversary of our first date, so we had our first date 11 years ago on the 24th, and then we got married 9 years ago on the 24th, and this is the first anniversary that we have not been together. I am still in Montana helping my parents, and he is in California. We had hoped that he might be able to come up for the anniversary, but unfortunately that did not happen, so... We just had to do a lot of phone calls and FaceTime and those sorts of things. I sent him a silly video in the middle of the night uh, when I was awake and it was our anniversary and, you know, just things like that. So missing him definitely, but uh, we'll be with him soon and we'll celebrate when we are together once again. I hope you are doing well. I hope that you have been doing something fun or if you haven't had time to do something fun, you least still had time to do the fun thing of reading, uh, which I was going to say that you've had time to read, which indicates that I don't think reading is fun, and that's completely inaccurate, as you know. We are speaking, we, I, um, you are listening, I am speaking, I don't know, speaking with author Carter Wilson today about his new novel, The Dead Husband. Let me first say that The Dead Husband is a really fun title for a book in that you can have very strange conversations about that title. For instance, when I received the book in the mail from Carter's publicist, I sent her an email and said, hey, I received the dead husband in the mail today. (laughs) It's a good thing that people aren't, you know, well, maybe they are reading our emails, but um, that, that would have been a very confused email reader, I think. Or you can, you know, say to your friend, yeah, I went to the I went to the store today. I bought the dead husband. It's a good title, and it's fun to work randomly into conversations. It is suspense and a thriller. Let me go ahead and tell you um, what it says on the back. A A murderer, a victim, and a witness, but no one in this house is innocent. 20 years ago, an unspeakable tragedy rocked Rose Yates' small, affluent hometown, and only Rose and her family know the truth about what happened. Haunted by guilt, Rose escaped into a new life. Now she seems to have it all. A marriage, a son, a career. And then her husband is found dead. As far as Detective Cullen Pearson is concerned, Rose is guilty. Her marriage wasn't as happy as she led everyone to believe. And worse, she's connected to a 20-year-old case. She can play the part of the victim, but he won't let her or her family escape justice this time around. Grieving her husband and struggling to make ends meet... Rose returns home, hoping to finally confront her domineering father and unstable sister. But memories of a horrific crime echo through the house, and Rose soon learns that she can't trust anyone, especially not the people closest to her. That is, again, the description on the back of The Dead Husband. It is by Carter Wilson, and it is suspense. It's got it's a thriller. It has lots of crazy family dysfunction within that suspense and that the you know the thriller aspect in fact I would say that the suspense and thriller aspects of the book definitely revolve around the dysfunctional family as I'm sure you could tell from the description of that book a couple of things happened that I wasn't expecting a couple of things happened that I was kind of expecting so good you know good surprises here and there in the book and I appreciate that suspense thriller but again you know me not a lot of gore not a high body count those sorts of things I could deal with the level of in this book so 
maybe I should have a, maybe that's, that should be my, my scale. I should come up with a, a scale of, yeah, and, and, and give you that when I'm talking about books that I, like this, thrillers, suspense, horror, which I tend to steer clear of, but I'll look into that. In the meantime, let's go ahead and turn now to the interview with Carter Wilson. Again, the book is called The Dead Husband. Hi, Carter. Welcome to the podcast. I'm glad, glad to be here, Sarah. I'm glad to have you here, and I'm excited to talk about your new book, The Dead Husband. Before we get to the book, though, if you could share a bit about yourself, that would be wonderful. Yeah, so um, I'm Carter Wilson, and uh, I'm, uh, I write th- psychological thriller novels, um, and my, my seventh one just came out, um, and I actually didn't start writing until my 30s. I have a I have a background, I have a business background in the hospitality industry, and uh, writing just kind of uh, came about for me, and and I've been doing it for about 18 years now. Wonderful. Um, So let's talk about the book. Can you give a premise of, just an overall premise of The Dead Husband? Yeah, so when I start writing books, I never have an idea about what I'm doing, um, and so I don't outline, I just write kind of from the seat of my pants, and every book kind of just begins with a, an opening scene that just occurs to me, and I don't know what the scene is about or who these people are, um, but I had I had a scene in mind of a woman in her mid-30s standing at the door of her childhood home, and it's a mansion, and she's she's returning home, and she's got her son by her side, and we don't know why she's returning home, but she is worried about returning home. And then as I started to develop the story, I realized, oh, she's returning home because her husband died from an overdose, a prescription um, sleep medication and alcohol, and she she's returning home for help. But uh, it, we, we soon find out that she becomes a suspect in her husband's death while having to reconcile with some uh, a pretty awful past that she's actually returning to. So that's kind of the overall premise of the story. Now, normally I would ask uh, what your initial inspiration was for this, um, but it sounds like, you know, you you don't tend to have really inspirations for the whole story, just that, that opening scene. Um, so how does that... How does that work? Does the does the story kind of come to you as you start writing and getting into it more, or um, how does that process work for you? Yeah, I mean everything's a puzzle, and and I will say sometimes there's certain kind of themes or even emotions that I know that I'm going to want to write about, and for whatever reason I wanted to write about two sisters. I thought that might be interesting, and I don't, I don't really know why that came to me. Um, so I realized that uh, this woman returning home, Rose, that her sister still lived in that in that same town, and there's some conflict between them. Um, but yeah, everything is a puzzle to me. So I, I you know, I, I write that opening scene, and you know, I quite literally spend the rest of the book trying to figure out that opening scene. And so it, to me, it's 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 a puzzle to be solved. And so every day when I sit down to write, it's exciting to kind of see what the different possibilities are. Um, so yeah, it, it does unfold to me, but you know, you certainly take some different directions and you might have to reverse and, 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 and go back and rewrite again because it didn't quite work. Um, and then usually about, I don't know, 70, 80% into the book, I kind of start to see where the ending might be. And I start to realize what maybe the themes are and the connective tissues in the book. Um, and that's kind of, that's kind of the enjoyable part is when you kind of, hopefully see that your subconscious has been working all along and you're like, Oh, this is, this is a book about loss or this is a book about, you know, being addicted to saving people or whatever it is. You don't quite realize it front of mind until you kind of step away from it and look back. When you figure out that, that end point and what the book is about, do you tend to have to go back and do either major or minor edits uh, to the rest of the book to kind of make it flow a little better? Yeah, for sure. I mean, whether you outline or not, I think you're always going to go back and there's always going to be second, third, and fourth drafts. Um, And, you know, I might realize a twist at the end that necessitates kind of some foreshadowing early on in the book that might not be major, but needs to be done. Um, And then certainly once it goes to my editor, my editor might come back with some, you know, major edits as well. Um, So it's, you know, really, until it goes through copy edits, it's 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 a pretty fluid work in progress. Um, 
but that's that's kind of the joy of it all. Editing is great. I mean, editing is where the book comes alive for sure. Jump in here so we can take our first break of the podcast, but I just have to comment on what Carter was just saying about editing. That is not something that I hear from many authors. Some people love editing, but often they do not enjoy it. So it's fun to hear. This is what I love about doing all of these interviews and speaking to different authors is you get uh, you get all different kinds of personalities and writing types and people who love editing and people who hate editing. And so I just I just like that I get all of that variety. When we come back, we'll be talking a little bit more about that aspect of editing and how some people love it, some people hate it. (laughs) But stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Hey, it's Sarah here to tell you about the Infinity Pro by Conair with the Knot Doctor all in one dryer brush. I just took this traveling with me, and it is amazing in that it is a three-in-one tool. I didn't have to pack extra equipment with me just for my hair on this trip. It has a hair dryer. It is a volumizer. It is a detangler. It can do all of these things in one step. The large oval brush creates glam waves. The bristles painlessly remove knots as you dry and style. It uses ionic technology to create a frizz-free look effortlessly. Speaking of that frizz-free look, there are three heat settings plus a cool setting that will lock in your look for effortless looking hairstyles. It's got a bonus volumizing attachment included that gives you added lift at the roots And the removable attachments make storage at home or away super easy. Like I said, I just traveled with it and it was so easy and so convenient. If you would like your very own Infinity Pro by Conair with the Knot Doctor all-in-one dryer brush, simply go to conair.com and search dryer brush. Again, that is conair, C-O-N-A-I-R dot com and search dryer brush. Are you tired of the same old news? Are you sick of the seemingly endless political spin and negativity? The GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast is a weekly news podcast covering all the top positive and uplifting news stories. We cover stories that will inspire, uplift, and remind you of the good in the world. Tune into the Golden State Media Concepts America Still Beautiful podcast to get all the great and positive news stories of today. Download the GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast on iTunes. Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author Carter Wilson about The Dead Husband, which, as you know, is the title of the book and not just a really weird conversation that we decided to have. So let's go ahead now and return to that interview. Some people love editing. Some people hate editing. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's it's a lot of work, so don't get me wrong. It's not like I'm, I'm super excited about it. But, you know, when I get editorial notes from my editor... It's always daunting. I'm sure you've had many authors tell you that you get your first editorial letter and it's like, oh, you know, look what all I have to do now. But it's also exciting to like see your book from a different person's perspective for the first time and look at their notes and say, oh, yeah, this is going to make it better. So that's always exciting. Mm -hmm. The book is written from two different points of view from Rose, who is one of the sisters, the one who's returning home and Colin, who is a detective investigating initially her husband's death. Um, So first, what about these two characters do you think will either resonate or not resonate with readers um, as they're going through the book? I mean, you know, the the primary point of view, as you mentioned, is from Rose and that's first person um, present tense. And, And I, I, I love writing from her perspective because I think she's she's a pretty vulnerable character and I think readers will probably find her, you know, relatable on, on some level. Um, she's going through a lot of struggle, but she's also got some very dark things in her own past to reconcile with. And she's got a marriage that wasn't by any means perfect. Um, and she's got the pressure of, of a detective kind of investigating her 
Um, so I, I, I think she's got a lot going on that I think readers will find interesting. And Colin, you know, I, I wanted to write this book. I wanted there to be an, an investigatory element to it, um, which I don't normally do. I don't ever write procedurals. And so this was the first time I had a detective. And it was this character was important enough to me to, to have his own point of view. And uh, it's a little bit more distanced than Rose's. It's um, third person past tense. And, but it was important that he was fully fleshed out as a character. He wasn't just, you know, a cop looking to make a bust. He had his own issues and that there were parallels between Rose and Colin that they might not realize. Um, so, yeah, and I think readers will hopefully enjoy kind of that aspect of well is like his, his, his dedication to the job, his dedication to, you know, what he believes to be true and, and how he deals with his own family issues. Yeah, um, they do definitely, as the book goes on, have um, some more parallels in their in their story. So that's, right. that's it's interesting to watch that develop. Um, you don't outline. Um, so what kinds of character development do you tend to do? Do you do that as it goes on? Do you maybe have an idea and then sit down and maybe and flesh out a character, or does that really evolve as you write? Yeah, I think it's an evolution. I, it, you know, those things are never, and, you know, and plot as well. Those are things I'd never really think about, you know, top of mind. I don't think about like, well, this person needs to, you know, become self-actualized by the end or, or this person needs to have changed. I just write what's interesting to me and I can kind of visualize these characters and visualize what they're doing almost cinematically. And so I just kind of write down what I see and you know, hopefully my, you know, my own levels of empathy are coming through enough where I'm giving them, um, you know, emotions and, 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 and reactions that are um, relatable. So, but it's, it, it is kind of boils down to like, it's, it's what's interesting to me and hopefully it'll resonate and hopefully that character development will be there. Um, but again, yeah, it's, it's never something I'm, you know, top of mind thinking about, you know, this character hasn't been developed enough. I feel like the um, the plotters, you know, there's plotters and panthers. I feel like the plotters who are listening to this interview are just going to be kind of <laughs> dancing up right now. <laughs> Everyone but has I mean, their own. It, it, but. Yeah, it's, it's about the journey, though, right? Like, I've, I've tried outlining, and I just get bored, and, and then I immediately deviate from that outline because I'm constantly thinking, like, what if? So I might be writing a chapter, and if I, I might just say, well, what if? What if this guy just died right now? I don't know that that's what I'm going to do, but what if he did? What ramifications would that have to the rest of the story? And so I might just write that and see what happens. Um, but again, that's the thrilling part for me is, is the, the discovery of it myself. And I think if I had outlined everything, you know, I wouldn't have that thrill as I'm writing it. Sure. Yeah, I, I I understand. You know, I, I I can understand from both perspectives. So oh, I'd for sure. To to hear how people go through their their writing process. Um, there's a line in the book that Colin says to Rose, and it's I mean it's it's a line that lots of people know of, and it, that line is write what you know. Um, mm -hmm. So are there do there tend to be autobiographical elements in your writing or not? I mean, it's interesting because like I, I strive to write things very much that I don't know because that's, again, more fun for me. Um, and, you know, years ago, I would get a lot of comments that, you know, oh, I can totally see you in this character, friends of mine would say. And, and that always kind of bothered me because I, you know, I, I wanted to have more of a unique voice. And I, that's actually when I shifted to starting writing, writing a lot more from a female point of view, because that was much more interesting to me because I got to kind of embody a, a very different voice than my own. Um, but again, I, and I tend to set things in locations that I'm not familiar with. In this book, I actually made up a, a town for the first time. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people who subscribe to the right what you know. And my mom, <laughs> my mom was always kind of concerned about me because some, some of my earlier books were pretty dark. And like, mom, if I wrote what I, what I knew, then I'd be a serial killer. And, <laughs> and hopefully I'm not. So, but yeah, I, I like to discover new things for sure. All right. 
And then what kinds of research did you do for this particular book? I mean, this one, and I, I typically don't like doing research because it's just work. And, and and a lot of people love research and their books really um, are spectacularly researched. And I usually write from a point of view of somebody who's not necessarily, you know, an assassin or a spy and doesn't need to know all the different types of weaponry out there. They're just kind of a, an everyday person. So there's usually not a ton of research I need to do. But in this case, I actually had a detective. Um, so I wanted to make sure I got that right. And I've got a just an old, old buddy of mine um, from childhood, actually, who's a detective in California. And so I would call him and say, I need this to happen. What's a believable way of making this happen? Um, you know, would it, can a detective get permission to go to another state to interview a suspect? Um, how does that work? What do you do when you sit down to interview somebody that's not at the police station? What kind of recorder do you use? You know, things like that. So, and I'm sure, I'm sure I took way too many liberties, but that was, that was, you know, critical that I had his input for, for the character of Colin. I like in your acknowledgments that you you know acknowledge that you have a you have a friend who helped you with the police procedural parts, but <laughs> that any any liberties taken are completely yours and don't blame him. Yeah, yeah, I don't want him to get get in trouble because I did some really crazy things with a uh, cop protocol. <laughs> right, right. What about this type of book, psychological thriller? Um, what what draws you to writing in this genre? I mean, I I, I love. It's not that I love conflict. I love tension. I and I love um, anything to do with how one perceives their world around them. You know, I, and I love the idea of like you sometimes can't trust your own mind. That's you know, there's a there's a thread of memory that is woven through all of my books because I think memory is both. Um, beautiful and horrifying. Um, and I love kind of that duality. So, um, you know, my books will tend to have a lot of um, paranoia in them and maybe not a lot of actually bad things happening, but a lot of like, um, you know, again, that psychological tension, because it's just interesting to, to me to, to kind of embody this character and to, you know, from a safe distance, be able to say, well, what would I do if this happened to me? Um, and that's what I want readers to feel as well. But it, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of a powerful journey to say, like, you know, here's a pretty horrible thing that's happening to an ordinary person. What if that were happening to me? How would I handle this? And to kind of see, you know, and to kind of go through that process, I think, is always thrilling and, and, and emotional. So it's, it's something I for sure enjoy. Time for our second break of the podcast, but more with Carter Wilson when we return. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the interview with author Carter Wilson. Mm -hmm. I'm, books like this, I, I try not to give a lot away because that's kind of the whole point of, you know, following the journey. So I, I keep coming up with questions that I don't want to ask because I don't want to give stuff away in the book. But right, um, right. can you talk a little bit more about uh, Rose's family, her father and her 
sister and um, maybe just. Yeah. Without giving. Yeah, for sure. About that. Right. Well, we know we we know that Rose Rose was raised alongside her sister, her older sister Cora, by their father. Their mother died when they were both young, and the father is this kind of this financial baron, a, um, you know, a, a private equity, you know, investor. And he's just, you know, a real tyrant. And he's a kind of a ruthless person. And he puts kind of family above all else, even though, though he doesn't necessarily exhibit any love for his family. And a horrible event happened in that house when Rose was in her teens. And Rose basically got out, you know, when she was 18, she left and she never came back. Um, because of what happened there. Um, and, and this thing has remained a secret. So her returning home in her mid thirties to seek help after her husband passed away was more than just that. It was also, you know, she needs to come and reconcile with her past and with her, you know, tyrannical father and her quite unhinged sister, um, you know, having to, to, to deal with those elements while she deals with the death of her husband and the pressure of being investigated for that, for that very death. So um, there's a lot of baggage that she's looking to, <laughs> to shed uh, in this process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what are you working on now? So I actually have my next book is called The New Neighbor and it comes out, I believe, April of next year. And it's, it's interesting because it's actually a companion book to The Dead Husband, which I've never done before. It's not a sequel, but I will say it takes place not only in the same town, but in the same house um, as The Dead Husband, but in an entirely different set of characters. Um, and there, there are threads of The Dead Husband uh, in the book. So it's, I mean, I had a blast writing that book. Um, and I'm about halfway into something new that, you know, true to my, true to my form. I don't quite know where it's going and I don't quite know what it's all about, but uh, I will say it, it kind of centers on a 21 year old um, female savant uh, back in, uh, it takes place in 1987. I was feeling very kind of nostalgic and I, I love the challenge of like, okay, 1987, there are no smartphones. So when you're out alone <laughs> in the countryside, you're alone and what are you going to do? Um, so it's it's been a lot of fun to write so far. And fashion is just very exciting in 1987. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I tell you, like, you know, that's the fun kind of research when, you know, you have a character walking into a mall and you pull up pictures of malls from 87. And, oh, Tom McCann and Walden Books. And I remember those and the, the <laughs> arcade games. And, yeah, so it's been fun. Hot dog on a stick. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I haven't thought of this book forever. That's sad. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, are there any of your other books that you would like to highlight? You said you have seven published. Is that correct? Yeah, so I have seven published. They're all, you know, again, they're all kind of just standalone psychological thrillers. And I, you know, when I each book that I start out, I start with just this wave of excitement because it's just a completely different story and I have no idea where it's going to go. So, I mean, The Dead Husband is, even though the title is kind of similar, is very, very different from The Dead Girl 2A, which came out the year prior, which is more about, you know, two strangers who are connected through uh, a loss of, of memory and, and some childhood experimentation. So it's, you know, totally wildly different, but again, still kind of that psychological thriller. So um, yeah, they're all, they're all blast to write. Fun. You said that you started writing in your thirties. So what precipitated that? What led up to you deciding that you would write for publication? Uh, boredom. So I was, in a class one day for a continuing education class for an appraisal license I once held. So you can imagine how exciting that sounds. Mm -hmm. um, an eight hour class in a dingy Ramada ballroom. And I, I wrote a puzzle. I, I wrote out a puzzle to myself, a little murder mystery puzzle and decided I would spend the last couple of hours of the class trying to answer this question that I posed myself to, just to, to pass the time. And I couldn't figure out an answer to this question I made up. And so I went home and I started thinking about it more and I started kind of writing out like, you know, a kind of a backstory of what would explain or what would answer this question. 
And I just started writing and I had no idea how to write, but I just started writing. And 90 days later, I had a 400 page manuscript and it was, it was a real epiphany for me, you know, I, and, and again, it wasn't good, but I did it. And so I kind of sat back and said, you know, kind of took stock of my life and said, maybe this is something I, you know, I'm meant to do. And I haven't stopped writing since. And, you know, my first three books, I got, I got an agent with my first manuscript, which was, I'm realizing now how fortunate I was. Um, <laughs> but my first three books didn't sell. So, and I just kept writing and I decided I loved it. And I learned how to do it and I learned the publishing industry and, and then kind of haven't looked back. All right. So from that experience and kind of learning from the ground up, do you have advice for aspiring authors? I mean, I think I think the thing that that is important above all else is just and I know you've probably been told this a million times from other authors you've talked to is like you just have to do it. You you know, whatever your whatever your voice is, whatever your methodology is, and all of those things will change over time. Nothing happens unless you're actually putting words on paper. Um, and, and so I, you know, I write seven days a week. Um, but I write just an hour a day usually. So, but if I do that seven days a week, I can get a book done in 10 months. Uh, so it's that, and some days it sucks. Some days it feels like you're doing data entry and it's not fun at all. And that's okay. <laughs> you know, a lot of people have jobs that they don't like. You know, sometimes writing's like that too. But I know a lot of writers who have great ideas and great aspirations and they just, there's something holding them back from just getting the the words on the paper. Um, so consistency is really the, the main thing. Time for our last break of the podcast. But when we come back, Carter will be talking about what he likes to read when he's not reading for research purposes. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Pets bring such joy to our lives, and the GSMC Pets Podcast is here to share in that joy. We'll tell stories of pets finding their forever homes, acting in unexpected ways, being helpful, or just being silly. Whether you love dogs, cats, llamas, reptiles, fish, or you've never met an animal you didn't like, the GSMC Pets Podcast is for you. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with author Carter Wilson. When you take the time to read for yourself, do you tend to read in the genre that you write or do you have uh, favorite genres and authors that you turn to? Yeah, I actually rarely read thrillers unless, uh, you know, maybe if I'm being asked to blurb something, um, but I, I just don't. Um, Occasionally, I will. Actually, I mostly read not fiction, nonfiction. I love, I love biographies. I love, you know, origin stories. I love to find out how did this person become this person. Um, and I think that actually totally influences how I write characters because you can see, you know, with real people, things that changed their lives, things that happened that that you know informed decisions they made later. So um, I'm always just, I'm just fascinated by people. So I think reading biographies really lets me kind of explore, explore people's minds really, really deeply. Is there a biography that you've read recently that you really, really enjoyed? I mean, I picked this one up. Uh, it, it's a biography of Mike Nichols, who is a famous uh, director of stage and screen that I didn't know very much about. Um, and he became hugely influential and, you know, it's 700 pages about him and I loved it. I loved just reading his story and, and it was super fascinating. Um, and even though it's not in an industry or, or interest of mine, just finding out how this person became successful, how they were flawed, what were their demons, um, you know, I think is, is, is always very engaging stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. Where can people find you um, on the internet, uh, website, social media, et cetera? 
Yep, yeah, pretty much everywhere except for Twitter. Um, but yeah, my website is carterwilson.com, and uh, you can find. And I have a I have a, a, in, a conversation series I'm doing with other authors, and you can find out find some of the recordings there, and um, and links to all my social media on my website. Okay. Now the back of the book does have Twitter. Are you no longer using that account? No, it does. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I just never really used it, and then it just, it's just—it's such a toxic wasteland that I'm like, why do I even still have this account? So I just—I um, just got rid of it. But uh, that's good. To get. <laughs> good to know. Thanks for letting me know that. Sure. Um, <laughs> we have talked about a variety of things today, but is there anything that we haven't covered that you were hoping to bring up, especially about um, the new book, The Dead Husband, or or writing in general? Just anything we haven't covered. I don't think so. I think we hit all all kind of the the major points. So I, I appreciate the time to uh, get to talk to you and 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 for the conversation. Well, I appreciate you taking the time out of your weekend as well. Um, it was great talking to you. And again, the book is called The Dead Husband. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sarah. Take care. Thank you once again to Carter for taking the time to join me. I mentioned earlier as we were going to break that, you know, some authors really love editing, some authors don't. And then there are authors who, you know, there's that pot plotters versus pantsers conversation. Some people are plantsers, uh, which I think is hilarious. But, you know, whether you write out an outline or whether you just kind of let the story take you, I am also fascinated by those conversations. And Carter definitely had my attention when he was talking about how he has something in mind when he starts and he just sees where the story writing process takes him from that starting point. I'm not sure like my, my type A personality, sorry for that bump. Uh, my type A personality does not find that comforting, but I know that other people do. And so there's just a whole world of different people and different types of processes. And I find it really interesting. And I'm grateful that people talk to me about that stuff. So thank you to Carter. Thank you to you, of course, as always. I hope that you will join me next time when I will be interviewing Payal Doshi, a debut author about her book, Rhea and the Blood of the Nectar, which is a, a middle grade fantasy book so much fun. I loved it. My 10-year-old niece, no, oh, oh yeah, no, 10-year-old still, a uh, birthday coming up. My, my niece, the one that you've met, Risa, also loved it. She read it in about 24 hours, and that was one of the books you know, that, you know, well, how many books should I take when we're going on this trip? We're only going overnight. Oh, you're right. I'll, I should get six instead of only five. But she just read that in the car. Excuse me, I keep bumping the mic. I apologize. She read that in the car. She finished it and she loved it. So I'm very happy about that. Now another niece has it and I don't think she started it yet, but I'm looking forward to hearing her opinion on that. Anyway, so please join me for that interview with Pyle Doshi and the book is Rhea and the Blood of the Nectar. It is the first in a series. Series. If you are a fan of this podcast, as always, I would ask you to write a review or leave a starred review. Either way, that helps us to get the podcast out to more people. Please also follow and interact on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I would love to hear your thoughts. So uh, if you haven't done so already, follow on social media, whatever platform you like to follow. I have a TikTok account. I have not done anything on that TikTok account. I feel like I'm too old. <laughs> I know I'm not. There's lots of great, great um, creators of all ages on TikTok, but I haven't quite gotten brave enough yet to put myself or the podcast out there. But maybe, maybe soon. I'll, I'll work up my courage. Thank you again so much for joining me. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I hope, of course, that that day involves plenty of time to get yourself lost in a good book. Thanks. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from Moon movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook 
Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.